Hello everybody and welcome once again to Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there in this very difficult time. Today I want to talk to you about software requirements and particularly I want to talk about them in the context of Scrum as an agile method, which is a little different view than I'm used to teaching, so you'll have to bear with me. I have to warn you that this is going to be a longish talk, I think, so, but I couldn't find any convenient way to break it into nice pieces, so please, if you get find yourself getting over full or lost, push the pause button, and you can always pause it and come back to it at any point. I promise the recording will wait for you. So let's go ahead and dive into this. So the first question about a new software product that you're proposing to build, and again, the book takes a very product focused view, but for any kind of software project really is why, why am I doing this? Uh, it's a question you should always ask yourself and you should ask yourself twice and then ask yourself three times because software is hard. It takes a ton of effort. And if you don't have some reason you think that this would be a thing, you're, if you're not very confident that there's a reason that this would be a thing that should be out there, then you'd be better off to stop early. One of the first rules of any kind of engineering is fail as early as possible. And that sounds like a funny rule, but what it means is try to figure out that it's time to stop before you've put in too much effort. The, the worst thing that can possibly happen is that you get almost to the end and then decide that the whole thing isn't gonna work out. And so we're always trying to fail fast if we're gonna fail and we should start with, is this really a thing we wanna build? And there's sort of several reasons the book lists for this. It might be that we're better meeting a need met by some existing product. We know that the existing products are selling well or are being used by people, but we also know they have significant problems and we think we can do better, importantly better, substantially better. It might be that there's some need that they're just that could be solved by a software product and there just isn't a software product that in that niche yet. That's a thing that happens in the real world and if you identify such a thing, then building some software is a really good idea. And the third thing is that it may be that as the technology capabilities of the world leapfrog each other every day, it may be that suddenly there's an opportunity that nobody had ever conceived was even a thing before and you might want to jump in and build a software product. So now you've got an idea that you want to build a piece of software and you go out and do the research to make sure you really understand what's going on. It is super important to not skip that stage where you convert your belief into a belief that you can defend because other people who look at it also hold the same belief because the belief is something that has facts underlying it and support underlying it. That's its whole own discussion outside the scope really of a software engineering class. But if you're going to be entrepreneurial and develop a product, it's one of the most skipped steps. And what it leads to is what I said earlier, late failure, you fail later on when you could have failed at this stage. So now you've decided you wanna build a thing, you have some kind of product vision which is the broad outline of this is a thing that I want to build, how do you refine that vision into something that you can sort of actually build, design a product around? And the answer to that is you go through a process of feature identification, you identify illities, that is other properties the software has to hold, and we also think about the space of design constraints which are things that have to be true of the product for sort of extraneous reasons. And those are the three things that as we drill down into the details keep coming up. And the thing that especially comes up are what we call features, which is the product should do this thing, the project product should do that thing, the product should behave in this way and that way. Uh, the We'll talk in a bit more about the idea of a story card. So a book example here on this one is, as an author, I need a way to organize the text of my book into chapters and sections. So that's a little story about a thing that the software has to be able to do. And if it 
if you're building an authoring tool, that's something that you're really going to want to have as part of your tool set maybe. And so you write it down and you remember that that's a thing you're going to build into your software. And that becomes the basis of design and implementation is those kinds of stories. We also have a couple other things that are easy to forget or overlook, but turn out to be really important in software development. What we call an illity. We call them illities because they're things like stability and quality, uh, you know, various kinds of capabilities. There are things that sort of need to be true of the software. They're requirements in the sense that if the software doesn't meet them, it's no good, but they aren't really features. They're, they tend to be emergent properties. The software will, every software transaction must complete within 60 seconds, for example, or the software must be able to run without failure for you know three weeks without crashing for three weeks um you know that's the kind of thing that is absolutely part of the requirements but you wouldn't really say the runs long time feature is a thing maybe or maybe you would but the point is don't forget those kind the kind that aren't this is what the software does but this is what the software has to be to meet your goals the third sort set of things that tends to find its way into requirements are what we call design constraints, which are requirements that aren't really related to what the product wants to do or the product wants to be. They're just external stuff that has to happen. So for example, it's not uncommon for whoever wants the software to just say, look, I want it to be written in this particular programming language. The software must be written in UCSD Pascal. Now that's not really a uh, requirement in terms of function, it's not even an illity, right? It's just an external constraint. When you design it, you better pick Pascal because that's the only thing I'll take at the end. We generally view those design constraints as a bad thing. We try to keep away from design constraints and talk the you know ourselves if we're the if we're developing a product or the customer if we're developing a project off of those kinds of design constraints as much as possible because they really are limiting, but sometimes they're just there. So how do I get these? How do I get all these features? Let's start with where the book does, which is to say, well, maybe it's software's people, and so it's worth thinking about the people who are going to interact with our software as users, as maintainers, as you know, funders or whatever of this software, the people who are going to in interact with our product once it's out there, our user base, they're sort of our first priority. They're the people we have to make happy. They're the people we have to make productive. And so you can think about this in one of two ways. And sort of the easy way out is to just generalities, right? Well, I think the user blah. And the problem is the user blah statements are really, really easy to make. And they often don't have much connection to reality. And they often don't even help you understand what you need to build because they're so mom and apple pie. They're so, I, the user wants the software to, you know, fulfill their needs. Well, yeah, of course they do. What, what does that mean specifically? And so what we do do first is we try to actually, a lot of times, is take this more detailed approach of trying to actually make up specific people who are going to interact with the software. And we make them sort of representative in the sense that they're realistic pictures of what somebody might look like. So if essentially you're gonna be a fiction writer at this point, but you're gonna be writing a specific kind of fiction, a kind of fiction that tries for realism. You, you wanna typically give these personas, as we call them, these hypothetical, usually users of the software, names and some kind of humanizing details. So uh, Lando, and that's his gamer tag, which we'll use as his name, is a 14-year-old boy. He lives with his mom in a suburb of Portland. He mostly plays multiplayer first-person shooter and third-person shooter games, especially Halo and Counter-Strike. He uses Discord for in-game voice and text chat. And that's actually a pretty sketchy persona. If I was really doing this in a longer talk, I might spend another paragraph or two developing out Lando and who he is and you know how he uses games because if I'm going to build a game I want to understand Lando he's an important part of my market segment here and when I build games I want to keep Lando and the probably four or five other people 
just for users of the game, model users of the game, that you know, I, I want to develop an idea of who do I care about, why am I doing this, and those people, I want to actually have them in my head. I want to be able later on when I'm talking with the rest of the development team about features and requirements to be able to say, well, how would Lando feel about this? That's the thing I really want to be able to say. So you want to cover all the roles that might interact with the software. If you have an experienced gamer like Lando, that's great. You probably, for a gamer, can want to have some novice gamer that you want, you know, who's maybe not new to gaming altogether, but not a not a heavy gamer. You would want that kind of a persona as well. You might want to develop a parent as a persona that you think about when you're building games be aimed at kids. That's probably a good idea, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You really want to think about what kind of roles are going to interact with your stuff and cover them all. And when you're done with that, it's really easy to make these things up. I just said you were being a fiction writer. Um, it's really easy to write bad fiction. One of the easiest kinds of bad fiction to write is the kind that doesn't really turn out to have as much connection with the real world as you think it does. And that's bad in fiction. It's terrible in this situation. So you really need to check if you aren't an expert in the, you know, this kind of people, the, the, the domains, the domain of users who are going to work with your software, you probably should check with people who are and have them look at it and say, yeah, that's realistic. Yeah, I've met Lando before, right? Or no, Lando's not. Lando doesn't actually exist. I know it's an attractive looking stereotype. There are no Landos in this business. And you know, that kind of validation really, really makes a difference. And it's usually not that hard. It's a matter of showing personas to the to people, to potential customers or whoever, and saying, hey, does this look like somebody real? Once you've got personas, another thing you might want to build is some scenarios. We're going to ask you to write some more fiction and uh, actually think about some detailed stories about using the software. So these aren't going to be all possible stories about using the software because you don't have 100 million years to work on this. There are gonna be a few stories that are representative examples, but the point is they're gonna be detailed stories. We're gonna tell you sort of everything that goes on during one of these scenarios, no matter you know how peculiar it is, because what we want is to get a real feel for what interacting with the software looks like. So I've written out this scenario where Lando sits down, at the desk at his gaming desktop logs into the game he starts creating a new character he selects a gender and a class and fills out the cosmetics of his new character and notice that i'm you know i'm not i'm 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 leaving details in that you might not think are important right now it's he he happens to game on a desktop rather than a laptop lando does and he's using steam to log in rather than some other authentication method he's uh you know he's He's chosen to play a female character, which may be pretty common for males. Um, he's chosen this combat infantry class. So I'm sitting here filling in details that are maybe realistic, but they aren't the only way it could be, right? I could write this whole story a little bit differently and it would still be a plausible story. The idea isn't to cover all the bases at this stage. It's to get a story that you can work with. And sort of if you, as you're developing your requirements, you find that they're grossly inconsistent with these scenarios, that's a huge red flag. And if the requirements start to suggest things that none of your scenarios cover even a little bit, then you might wanna go and write some more scenarios to cover those cases. And so, you know, I've worked through a really detailed scenario here. Lando's mom calls dinner while he's still working on his character, so he leaves the screen open and leaves the room to eat dinner, and while he's out, there's a power glitch. Oh no! So Lando comes back and reboots his computer and logs back in, and apparently finds the character creation sort of where he left it, and selects his starting zone so that his character is now ready to go. That was a lot, right? That was really a lot. These scenarios tend to be pretty detailed and long to write down, and you're not gonna build requirements directly from them, but like I say, Developing realistic personas and developing realistic scenarios means that you get a realistic view of what it should be like to build this, to work with the software, and that really informs your requirement development pretty hard. 
you, you really want the details because they help catch missing stuff and they help you to start to organize how, what things are together, right? Even in this scenario, you start to see that, well, it looks like there's gonna be an authentication piece where you log in. Um, we should think carefully about what that piece should look like. And again, you know, validate your scenarios with domain experts. Is this a realistic story? You know, if it's a huge red flag, if you have some persona which doesn't appear in any of the scenarios, it's a huge red flag if you have some normal use, user story that doesn't have any scenario associated with, that's, that's too few. Scenarios can be uh, time consuming to write, but often it's a kind of time consuming that's A, less than you think it is, and B, you can really pay off down the road. Excuse me. <coughs> so, once you've built scenarios, then the next thing to build is user stories. And what's the difference between a scenario and a user story? Well, as our textbook says, you know, there's a continuum sort of between these two extremes, but generally a scenario is about detailed and realistic. A user story is about generic and a user story is really gonna correspond pretty strongly to a functional requirement. This is a thing we want the software to do. So looking at the previous scenario, we might have a story card that really says, as a player, I wanna create a customized character, right? And between that story card and a scenario is what we call a user story, right? The user sits down and creates a character and uh, specifies the characters, blah, blah, and blah. You know, these kinds of things can be put into a story that's really generic and doesn't have any specific persona associated with it. It's just a story about how some mode of the game is supposed to work. And then from that, you break that user story down into story cards and those story cards capture all of those individual requirements. And that's where our functional requirements come from to some extent. You develop them from the scenarios, the personas, the product vision. There's this notion of a story card that's an epic story card. And that's one that's too big to be directly interval. And you want to include those, but at either at the beginning or later, you want to break it up into multiple story cards so that you have something that you can implement pretty directly. You know, the if you have, I, the player wants to create a customized character, then you might break that epic down into, as a player, I want to select my character's gender, select my character's class, et cetera, et cetera. User stories should be pretty direction, directly actionable as code. When you have a story card, you should be able to identify a piece of code that's sort of the implementation of that story card. And it's a real red flag if the implementation of a particular story spread across the code because that can lead to validation and maintenance problems down the line. So I'm gonna close with a few tips about developing requirements because this is an art. Developing good requirements is hard and it takes time and it's something that you really have to practice in an industry setting because we don't really, short of this one class in capstone, we don't teach it in school. It's its whole own thing and is worth figuring out. One thing is, this is the stage at which you should cut anything you can figure out is cuttable. No more requirements, especially for the first potential release of something, you're really looking for a minimal thing. Any, any requirement you can leave out, any feature you can put by the wayside, don't, don't. It's, you're, play in easy mode. It's hard enough to build a piece of software that does anything you want. Don't try to make it, don't try to specify it to do all the things that it, you could possibly dream of. And remember, none of this is forever, right? Once you've got your software done and validated that your product is has a marketplace, validated that the stuff you did decide as features work and are good, you can always go back and put stuff back. It's okay, but it's much easier to go from a working, successfully deployed product to another one than it is to go from nothing to that first iteration. As you update, the vi as the vision changes, as your requirements change, don't forget to update and add scenarios and personas. The 
all of this is malleable and this is going to be a completely iterative process you're going to make some changes and the point is it's really easy to forget your old work products your scenarios and your personas and just leave them and as you start to develop user stories and story cards with the requirements on them go back and update the old stuff too really easy thing to forget can really help if you have that coherent story at the end of this stage of development don't forget the illities. There's way too common to have a product that has all the features specified but is missing the specification of some property of the software, you know, typically size or cost or runtime or whatever that was absolutely crucial and people forgot to write down and didn't really think about carefully until it was too late and then they find out that they built a thing that does everything you ask for but no one will be able to use it and that's a bad day so don't get there and the design constraints like i said earlier design constraints as we start talking about architecture which we will shortly as we start talking about detailed design as you start trying to figure out how to build your thing there again playing in easy mode is hard enough. If you are given free reign to figure out the easiest way to build something that meets all these requirements, that's plenty. Every design constraint that you can avoid is an opportunity to avoid having to do things the hard way. Having said that, you can't avoid them all. Right? If you're trying to sell into a product into a place where it's going to have to be maintained by your customers and they all only know MATLAB, you're likely to be writing MATLAB. You don't get a choice. It isn't like, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're fond of MATLAB or feel as I do about MATLAB. You're, you're going to be writing MATLAB software and that's just going to be a design constraint because the software isn't useful to them unless they can maintain it and they can understand how it works and it turns out that requires them matlabbing it's absolutely a thing that's going to happen just do push back when you can push back and think hard about whether that design constraint you're imposing on yourself really is a necessary one or not before you give up and accept it so that's what i know about requirements or at least the basic stuff I know about requirements. Hopefully this has been useful to you. As always, thanks for listening. I greatly appreciate it. As always, please do continue to stay safe and well out there in these difficult times. I look forward to talking to you again soon.